breaks the power of sin and darkness. Whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. He shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless and awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be saved. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory. The King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I see done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King. Conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Surround me with a song of deliverance 
from my enemies until all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. See, so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right. So I could stand and say, I am a child of God. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Welcome again to our service online. This evening we are really going to kind of step into the series that we mentioned last week, Jesus Encounters. Looking through the Gospel of Mark at some of the people and the lives that Jesus encountered through his ministry on earth. And as well as looking at what it meant for those people that Jesus encountered, also taking some time to think through what that might mean for us today. I hope over the coming weeks and very soon that we will be back together in person. Please do continue to journey with us as we look at some options of where we can meet together as church. And we really do hope that that is soon. But until then, we will still be here uh, together on Sunday evenings online. We are going to have some questions at the end of the sermon um, through this series that hopefully will just allow us to and um, to individually to look at what it might mean for us to put some of these stories into practice. But also when we're together to corporately just talk through 
some of what the scriptures might mean. This is not a series where uh, we want everything to be talked at you, <laughs> uh, but rather for us to learn together. What does it look like for us to take some of the lessons that we learn as Jesus encountered people and implement them into our own lives as we encounter so many people through the week? So could I encourage you uh, to grab a journal, grab a notebook, grab your phone, wherever it is that you take notes, write down ideas, thoughts, um, and just use it as a place to process some of what we're talking about. As I said, when we're together in person, bring that with you and hopefully we can journey through that together. Uh, but even as you're at home or wherever you're watching this from, if you have people around you that you're watching, we talk together through some of these questions or at least find some space on your own and just write down some of what Jesus is teaching you through this. But hopefully it won't just be something that we hear, but will be something that shapes what we do. And so we're going to start by looking at this first encounter, um, which is found in Mark chapter 2. Um, I'm sure it's known to some of us, uh, but we're going to read it together. The words will be on the screen, but if you have a Bible with you, can I encourage you to read along, highlight, note, and um, write in your notebook um, some things that stand out to you as we read this together. So we're going to start verse 1 in chapter 2. It says this. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors, there was no more room, even outside the door. Whilst he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralysed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above Jesus' head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mats and walk. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mats and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mats and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. Isn't this amazing? I love the paralyzed man because Jesus says, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And that's exactly what he does. He stands up, grabs his mat and off he goes out the door. No questions, no like jumping around, doing a dance. And he just goes home. And so straightforward and so simple. But we're just going to focus um, for the next couple of minutes on Jesus in this part of the story. Though the paralyzed man could have his own sermon, no doubt. But Jesus and his disciples have just travelled from Galilee, where they were in chapter 1, through back down to Capernaum. And Mark jumps straight from that several days later. Now, lots of stuff could have happened in these several days, and some of the other Gospels fill in some of what might have occurred in these several days. But Mark is keen to get us back to Capernaum, to see what miracles Jesus is doing back here, what conversations he's having, what encounters he's having. Remember from last week, we noted that Mark's point that his purpose in part of writing his gospel was to reveal um, that Jesus was this Messiah linked all told through the Old Testament in the beginning through the scriptures, that Jesus was this Messiah, the son of God who was coming to bring the restoration between God and man. And so all these encounters that Mark tells us of and, and the ones we don't read um, are all pointing to that that person who Jesus Christ is and that revelation that he wants to bring to us. And so then we meet these four friends. And obviously we don't know anything about these four people, um, but in obviously their preceding seasons of life, they have heard about this man, Jesus. They've heard some of what he does and they have um, gained a faith, a belief in the fact that they could, if they could get their friend to Jesus, physical healing was a possibility. 
Now, we don't know how much they understood about the spiritual authority or spiritual healing that Jesus could bring, but the physical need, the physical restoration that they desired, they had come to learn was possible through Jesus. And I want us to look at that point just for a minute, because how many encounters do we have with people in our community where there is a physical need? Not necessarily just a healing, but a physical need. Maybe there is healing. People are sick. Maybe there's a need for food or shelter. Perhaps people are stuck for childcare. Perhaps a car has broken down. People have, are short of finances for this month. It's not necessarily big crisis moments, so this in the story obviously is quite a significant moment and sometimes we do encounter those. But actually often in the day-to-day -day little moments, there are physical needs that need to be met. Many of you will know that uh, our kids have recently just moved schools and um, probably the second or third day into our school, I began to chat with a lady on the gate who told me that her childcare had just fallen through. She had a physical need. Now, that was our first time ever meeting. So me offering to pick up her kids and take them out somewhere was probably not the right suggestion because she had no idea who I was. <laughs> but in that moment, there was a physical need. And so we were, we chatted through and other people offered help and, um, and, and she had sorted out the problem. But actually just the simple conversation that we had at the school gate pointed out a physical need that was to be met. They are all around us. And here's what I love about these few friends, <laughs> is that they became aware of the physical need. Their eyes were open to the physical need of their friend and they didn't just sympathize or empathize or hang out with him. They became part of a solution to his problem. We don't know how they heard about Jesus. We don't know whether they were seeking out and um, help for their friend or they overheard that Jesus could bring a solution. But when they did find out, however they found out about Jesus and the potential, the possibility of healing that could come through him, they were back to their friend. Jesus was in town. This could be the solution. You have a physical need and we have a solution. If we could just get you to Jesus, then things might change. Why? Because they had faith to believe that Jesus could intervene. And we read that in verse 5, that it was that faith that moved the heart of Jesus to act. Verse 5 says, seeing their faith, seeing the faith of the friends who stood in the gap, who were part of the solution, who were seeking to, to, to bring a, a solution to the physical need, was what moved Jesus' heart. They were holding out faith for their friend. Because actually we don't even hear in the story how the paralyzed man felt. Did he have faith? Did he want, you know, he obviously allowed his friends to carry him to Jesus and he allowed himself to be lowered through the roof. So he had some faith <laughs> and some belief that this might make a difference. But actually it was the friend's faith that moved the heart of Jesus. We don't hear about the paralyzed man's faith. And actually, I think that's really key because actually when we encounter some people, we don't always know where their faith lies. We don't always get to hear whether they're desperate to find Jesus, whether they're desperate to find a solution, whether they've given up on finding a solution, whether they even want to find a solution. And actually, however we meet people, wherever they are on their journey of, holding faith for solutions, actually we can still hold faith for them. We can still be willing to carry hope, to carry faith for solutions for people who are unable to do it for themselves. Now, the friends don't drag their paralyzed friend kicking and screaming or screaming down to Jesus and, you know, drop him through the roof when he's saying no. He's willing to go and we can't drag people to Jesus. <laughs> we can't drag people or, you know, throw solutions at people when they don't want it. But actually for people who are willing, we can be ones who hold faith for them, who carry hope for them. 
that there might be breakthrough, that there might be physical uh, restoration for their situation. But the challenge this evening is, do we hold that faith? When we encounter people, when we're out in our workplace or at the school gate or um, in town doing our shopping and we encounter people who are in um, situations where there's a physical need, do we have the faith to believe that Jesus could intervene, an encounter with him could bring restoration. I must admit there are times when it is much easier to think, do you know what, you are beyond all hope. <laughs> you are beyond all help. Your situation is too far gone. But actually I don't believe that Jesus thinks that way. I don't believe that he looks at someone and says, do you know what, you're too far. That's too far away. The physical healing, that physical restoration is too, is too big a jump. And I think he wants us to carry that same heart. That no, we can't drag people along. But yet we should never look at someone and think you are too far beyond the grasp of Jesus. Your restoration is too big a leap, even for the Son of Man. When we encounter people. Are we like the friends who are willing to carry hope, to carry faith that an in just an encounter with Jesus could bring the restoration, the physical healing that they so desperately need? Now, I just want to make a quick point on here that the, the people are not our projects. These, these four men who carry their friend to Jesus, Mark uses that word, I think, very specifically. They're not just four men who are in a, on an assignment, on a project to do a tick box and do their good deed for the day by carrying this man to Jesus and leaving him there. No, Mark says, his friends. Why? Because actually, God doesn't just want us to project people to restoration. He calls us to love people actually love people, to be a friend to somebody, to care passionately for their restoration. Not because it's something we ought to do as Christians or something that looks good when we tell people in church on Sunday, but because we have a genuine heart of love. We are genuinely friends with those that we help. These four people love this man. They care for him, regardless of the fact that he was paralyzed, they had been his friends. And out of that desire for their friend and their, their hope for his life to be restored, they brought him to Jesus. And we need to have that same love and hope for people. And so I just want us, if you can, you feel free to pause the video and write down these questions. They will come up again at the end, but just on this note and again as I said when we're together we will talk through these <laughs> and hopefully learn and grow from each other but just where you are can I ask you just a couple of questions who are your friends who are you encountering each day are you allowing yourself to love those people are you allowing them to have insight into who you are as you have insight in to who they are. Who are your friends? Secondly, who are you holding faith for today? Who is it that you've encountered that has maybe a physical need or maybe a spiritual need and you're holding on to faith for them, that an encounter with Jesus would bring restoration? Can I encourage you to write those people down? It can be sometimes wearying when we don't see answers quickly or in the way that we wanted. But can I encourage you to write them down and continue to pursue, to continue to hold on to faith that them encountering Jesus would bring restoration? And perhaps the most challenging question is, do we actually believe that an encounter with Jesus can bring radical transformation, can bring radical restoration, could bring such physical healing as happened in this story in Mark? And actually allow God to refresh our faith that he is a God who can bring such transformation and who can bring such restoration. 
Secondly, I just want us to spend a final couple of minutes on one other aspect from this story that's key, I think, to how we also encounter people today. Because we've talked about the physical healing that Jesus bought. But actually, there was a spiritual healing that he bought too, and they're intrinsically linked together. Jesus wasn't just happy for this man to be healed and to go on his way. And we see this through his ministry. That actually, though the physical is important and is held by Jesus, actually so too is their spiritual restoration and well-being. It wasn't enough for people just to be released physically from strongholds, but Jesus longed to see them spiritually released from strongholds so that they could step fully into who he created them, to be fully in to restored relationship with him. Jesus, through this story, demonstrated to those watching and criticising that actually physical healing is, is easier to do because the effects are seen right away, right? Jesus says to this man, get up and walk. If he doesn't, everybody sees that the healing didn't actually take place. And Jesus says, you know, that's easier to see. But first I do the spiritual. But I, I've offered the forgiveness of sins because that too is held important by me. That is of significant value in this man's life. And so he demonstrates both spiritual healing, which may not be have been as evident in that moment, but yet still vitally important. Jesus acted and Mark recounted the process to show us as readers and to show as, he, as Jesus communicated with those that were watching and criticizing that actually both physical and spiritual restoration mattered to Jesus and both were possible with Jesus. Jesus cares for both physical and spiritual needs, cares for restoring both physically and spiritually. And so are we. The further challenge is that we too are called to care both for the physical and for the spiritual of those that we encounter. This may be a little uncomfortable, but let me just read you a little couple of lines. We will be of little good to those around us if we don't care for the physical situations and physical strongholds that they find themselves in. But we will be of little use to the kingdom if we care a little of the spiritual state of those that we encounter. Because actually Jesus calls us to care for both. Jesus demonstrates this beautiful balance between caring for physical and spiritual together, holding them right. We are called to bring restoration physically, to meet the needs of those around us, to feed those who aren't able to, to be provided for themselves, to clothe those, to, to fix cars that need to be, to offer whatever is needed to those that we are around, to our friends, to those we encounter. But God calls us not just to care for their physical restoration, but to care for their spiritual restoration. That actually they might be able to step into all physical and spiritual that God has for them. And as his church in Carrick, in Balnamore, in Drumshambo, in Boyle, in wherever you find yourself today, would we be a church? Would we be a people that care for the spiritual as well as the physical. And so a couple more questions for us to think of this week. How are we as church impacting those physically around us? And how as are we as church impacting those spiritually that are around us? Two very different questions, but so as we've seen through the story, intrinsically linked together. And finally, what does it look like for us to hold that balance well? What does it look like for us as individuals and for us as church to care about physical and spiritual needs of those that we encounter? What a great discussion that will be when we are together. But we would love for you just to think through that individually. What does that look like? 
I am just going to close this evening in prayer and the questions will then come back on the screen for a couple of moments. And can I encourage you to uh, think on them? If you're part of our church WhatsApp group, please do speak in to them um, and share some of your thoughts or do be in contact with us on Facebook um, as well. But let us just pray together as we finish. Father, I thank you for the story that Mark shares with us through his gospel. Jesus, that you encounter people. Father, that this man was brought straight to you and you didn't push him aside or, um, or call him up for interrupting your meeting, but you made space and time to see where he was and to speak into his life. And Father, that you cared about him physically and you cared about him spiritually. Father, that as a whole person, you were passionately eager for him to step into restoration. Father, for him, for you to be revealed as one who came to restore relationship between him and the Father. And to restore that that God had created. And Father, we too want to be a people that bring such restoration, that are pointers towards a God who longs to encounter people physically and spiritually. God, would you equip us to do that? Would you give us your eyes to see people that we encounter each day? to see their physical needs and how we can be part of the solution, to help us carry faith for those people. But Father, also how to invite you into each conversation. Father, that we would be pointers towards um, a God who longs to just encounter each and every one of those that he has created. Father, would you use us afresh this week? Would we give ourselves afresh and willing to you to be used however you would need to use us. Father, we thank you again that you long to use us as part of your great plan um, in, in making you known in this place. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us um, this evening. Please do keep in touch with us and we look forward to being together soon. The questions are going to come back up for a couple of minutes now just as we close. Um, but we look forward to seeing you. Have a really good week and God bless.